KFAI 90.3 FM HD Minneapolis and 106.7 FM St. Paul. Radio Without Boundaries. You are listening to Fresh Air Community Radio, KFAI 90.3 FM Minneapolis and 106.7 FM St. Paul, Radio Without Boundaries. You have tuned in to Play For Me. I am your host, Brenda Bell Brown. My guests on this Play For Me show are independent journalist and filmmaker Ralph L. Crowder III, and independent media producer, Cindy Lewis. They are here to share information on how, when, and where community can enter into Ralph's latest film venture titled, The Lost Negroes of North America. Listen up. Now, when I saw, what's that title again? The Lost Negroes of North America. I thought. The promo. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it again? The Lost <laughs> Negroes of North America. Okay. I don't know why my mind did this trick, mm. but I thought about the Lost Negroes of North Minneapolis. Mm. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. No, actually, I thought about the Lost Negroes of South Minneapolis. Yeah, there's mm. a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> to be honest mm. about it, the Lost Negroes of Minnesota. Uh, okay, let me not take it that far, but... The Lost Negroes of Detroit. The Lost Negroes of Memphis, Tennessee. And Chicago, oh, keep on naming Hey, okay. Florida, yeah. Tallahassee, right. and all over the place. But mm-hmm. now that you have qualified it with the Lost Negroes of North America, tell me all about it. The inspiration behind this came from actually finding a series of reels, uh, film reels, in my father's closet. Um, in various shoe boxes, um, my uncle Jim Crowder, who lived in South Minneapolis, um, was fortunate enough to have a, uh, camera, film camera, um, during the years of, uh, this film is focused on between 1945 and 1955, um, and when I stumbled on this this film footage, I was like, "Wow, this is crazy!" I mean, because it was silent film, didn't have any audio to it, some black and white, some color. And when you look at this film, I think um, what happened with me is it confirmed a lot of things that I was already feeling in my own spirit and noticing in the culture of today. When you see the energy and the um, the beauty of uh, our communities and families back then, you arguably have to ask the question, I mean, one, what happened? Two, um, was the Negro more progressive than the African American? When you think mm, anthropologically, Mm -hmm. socio-anthropologically, didn't we morph from Negroes to African Americans? We sure did, and that would be some form of progress, at least in the way we identify and um, define self and have connections to certain people, places, and things. But, um, again, when we look at our communities now, as we define ourselves again with another title, African American, and we go backwards and um, examine the then Negro communities, the answer has to be, man, we, we, we are definitely moving backwards quickly. Um, and that generation, and I'm focusing on a 10-year period between 1945 and 1955. If you look at that 10-year window and you compare that to now, th- there is no comparison um, there is no accident why these communities were destroyed and redeveloped and, um, 
Uh, well, what communities are you talking about? Because I know every time you go past, uh, yeah, what can I say? Economically speaking, every time you go past a, a poor, run-down community, you know, yeah, that's where the black folks live. Or every time you go past a place that has mm-hmm. a lot of um, signs that, that advertise fried chicken mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the churches that are notably mm-hmm. black, you go, yeah, this black community is still thriving so how can you mm. say? Yeah, that's a good that's a good twist. You know how you emphasize the community because what is community now compared to what community was then? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why we have to uh, stay uh, very closely connected with our history and understand the value of uh, generational um, exchange of um, wealth, which is um, who we are, where we come from, what we've done, um, how we've overcame, and how we progress, and. Um, when you look at that generation, um, again, uh, arguably you could say that that 10 year window, um, stands alone as being the only time in American history where we've had a quantified measure of progress, um, that is not comparable to any other time in American history. Now, are you talking about places like Black Wall Street in Oklahoma or? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a little bit prior to, and that was one specific community. You know, we did have other examples of different communities that had a, um, had a great deal of wealth and prosperity. But, um, during this 10 year window, I'm talking about a collective. And when I, when I'm speaking on a collective, I'm also, um, dealing specifically with the Northern, um, Negro experience, which was, um, as we all know, a part of that great exodus from the South to the North of these, um, communities um where you know obviously racism is following us wherever we go (laughs) but uh the 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 um relocation of uh um black bodies in these uh northern uh cities um and the um independent self-sustaining thriving communities that were created from that um Wow. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting story. And it's a story that I think has, um, suffered a lot of negative, um, a lot of negative labels behind the word Negro. Because now the word Negro means, you know, well, you say Negro, that's obviously I'm looking at you like you're less than, or you may be a threat to me because you don't have a certain value system that I do. And so, I mean, I guess I could initiate something right now and make it very clear. <laughs> Please call me a Negro and not an African American. <laughs> well, well, okay. <laughs> I, 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 the faces that conjure up in my mind are faces who, for instance, might mm, work <laughs> in the Trump administration. Mm-hmm. Those are the new Negroes, if you will. Uh, um, those are African Americans. <laughs> oh, okay. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of lost because, and this, I'm, I'm gonna blame it on my son okay. because you remember that that exhibit, Africa exhibit. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the docents came to his school one day when he was going to North <laughs> High School and was talking with the children about um, how do you identify? Because one of the things that they were pointing out is mm-hmm. we all are from you know the seven daughters of Eve, so to speak, and mm-hmm. which means we all have a lineage that harkens to an African continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son refused to say that he was African or Mm -hmm. African-American. He said, Mm -hmm. I have never been to Africa. Don't really want to go to Africa. I'm black. I'm blackity black, black, black. So So, you know, explain yeah. this this grand this grand yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Let's bring Negro uh, back. Uh, clap back for Negro. Yeah. yeah, we're definitely bringing Negro back. We're gonna make it sexy right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's go there. <laughs> but I mean, if you think about it, what was Marcus Garvey's newspaper called? Uh, the it new... was called the Negro World. Yeah. And... Uh, you Mo understand? Max is the new Negro. Okay, I mean, we can go down the line where you know Elijah Muhammad and all these people came out of the then Negro generation Mm -hmm. you understand Mm -hmm. negroes did identify with africa there was a lot of african pan-african movement within uh negro discussion Mm -hmm. um african americans have a very interesting um 
psychology at this point. And I think the, the, well, I mean, yeah, we can talk a lot about that, (laughs) but, um, let me just focus on that 10 year window though. First too. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about these Northern black communities and you see the, the enormous, um, self-sustaining, thriving businesses, social, economic, cultural, um, activity, education, value for education and so on that came out of that 10 year window. Again, um, we have to remember as we struggle with whatever we struggle with now, how did those people survive in the face of a, um, overt covert style of racism that was always there right after the, uh, United States went to war with somebody who, um, was called Hitler Mm. and who had a lot of influence in America Mm -hmm. and in politics of America at the time period. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a lot of things going on Mm -hmm. that are definitely generational patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm telling you that generation, um, you know, when, um, certain people lose connection to history, you know, you can definitely twist words up that Mm -hmm. might, um, be something that you need to look a little deeper in. You know, we're dealing with that exodus from the South to the North. There was a lot of atrocities, as we all know, um, crimes of all kinds of humanity and warfare that took place in the south but you know these things happen in the north too but the um travel is a beautiful thing because it allows you to kind of re rejuvenate restart um and reflect maybe on some things that happened in the south that a lot of like you said i mean i have family prior to new york that came from um alabama and um seligen alabama to be exact and um you know there's a there's a lot of a lot of a lot of things that happened that a lot of people kept quiet about in their in their need to survive.
You are listening to Japanese jazz artist Hiroshi Fukumura and Sodayo Watanabe playing their tune White Clouds from the Hunt Up Wind album, recorded in 1978. If you listen closely, you no doubt heard a sampling of O.C.'s The Chosen One. If not, fear not. I will be playing that tune in the second segment of this Play For Me show when I return with my guests, filmmaker Ralph L. Crowder III and media producer Cindy Lewis. It's that time again, everyone. KFAI is hosting its Spring Pledge Drive on March 16th through the 30th, and we are looking for volunteers to answer phones. Come join the fun for this event important to the continued success of our community radio station. Let us know of your interest and perhaps other skills to contribute by emailing volunteers at kfai.org. You are listening to Fresh Air Community Radio, KFAI 90.3 FM Minneapolis and 106.7 FM St. Paul, Radio Without Boundaries. You have tuned in to Play For Me. I am your host, Brenda Bell Brown. Listen up as independent journalist and filmmaker Ralph L. Crowder III explains how a people's migration patterns figure prominently in his latest documentary film project, The Lost Negroes of North America. Let's talk about the flavor of what people brought from the South to the North, because we always do these mad migrations. Um, for whatever reason, to escape mm-hmm. persecution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in America we get persecuted. Anyway, mm-hmm. to escape persecution, it justified and um, federalized too. But anyway, mm-hmm. I digress. Mm-hmm. To escape persecution, to get to a better economic status, um, is that what made the New Negroes the most resilient when it came to an existing tribe, so to, so to speak? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely um, coming from any uh, multiple forms of being resilient. If you think about, you know, like um, anybody who comes to America as a um, recent immigrant and you see the success of using the Somali community as an example, just one of them, um, you know, who who knows what kind of conditions that they left from. You understand that um, deal with conditions of war and persecution and otherwise. Um, but, you know, that travel you know, that ability to clear your head from some of the the um, unfortunate things that take place maybe in a, um, in a, uh, what is it, what is it called? Like, you know, how they have in Somalia, the, the, before they send you to America, the, uh, uh, the camps, what are they yeah, called? Yeah, they send you to the conditioning camps. Uh, they, there's a formal uh, word for it. The refugee. 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 Whenever you're trying to leave a certain situation that represents a certain kind of struggle and oppression and, um, and, and the, and the, the real things that come with that, when you get a chance to kind of just breathe a little bit, have an opportunity to have a little bit of, um, economic prosperity, um, a chance to regroup and culturally form together within the way that your skills, gifts, and talents work as a, as a people or as a tribe, whatever you want to do it. Um, that's what this, this, uh, 10 year window was. Um, but th- let's also keep in mind that there were Negroes that were still in the North. Everybody didn't, you know, come from the South. I mean, we were everywhere all over the world. So, um, uh, the thing that I really, feel that is needs to be magnified again in this 10-year window is the economic prosperity 
and the um because of the conditions of um uh segregated realities uh that followed from the north to the south i mean followed from the south to the north in places like minneapolis uh fortunately um we were able to um build our own communities and institutions because there was no other option and when there is no other option that means we have to uh cooperatively share our economic uh, growth together and and work together to uh, progress based on that foundation. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that at that time, the institutions, social, cultural, um, religious, and what have you actually thrived and they had, Mm. they, they built um, that strong foundation Mm -hmm. that we still stand on today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking about our grandparents. I mean, for some, our parents, but I mean, uh, you know, uh, grandparents and if you think about the the value um i i think of my grandfather and my grandparents specifically um both um who were married uh you know raised families um owned land uh participated in various um social and uh cultural Institutions of the community, uh, whether that be more faith, uh, who took great pride in, um, their children advancing, uh, in education and beyond. Um, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> where are we right now when we even think about our connections to family? I mean, right now, this is 2018. Most of these young ones don't even really have a solid connection to their father. And you know, the connection to the mom is even half baked at this time. Well, so, I mean, uh, I you just know. want to, I, I, I don't know. That's, that's for me a, um, something to ponder. Mm. Um, because I think it's still different as you move around, um, the United States of America. I think that there is a different kind of thing going on mm. in the north as opposed yeah. to the south. And I'm dealing with these the northern west. communities mm-hmm. because ironically you would find out that in the heart of the Confederacy right now in Richmond, Virginia, where I went to college, uh, that is one of the, probably the best places for black people to be in terms of their economic um, possibilities. Uh, somewhere like um, uh, when you think of like Prince George County, Maryland, um, one of the best places, Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Even black folks in Mississippi are doing better than us Negroes in Minneapolis. Well, there's a, <laughs> see, I, I'm going to hold up the banner for us folks here in Minnesota land, you know, because when it, when you break it down, um, the, high incidence of places where we can go and be us, for us Mm -hmm. and enjoy things of us Uh, it's at a very short measure here in Mm -hmm. the twin cities especially where you have the highest concentration of people of color including you know us negroes Mm -hmm. um for instance arnella's i i rude the day that it closed Mm -hmm. i remember when i used to walk in at lunchtime to just pick up fried chicken for mm-hmm. my family, you know, from Nardi's back in the back. Mm-hmm. And I would see folks like Chief Finney and uh, some other folk that I won't name because they might not want me to name their <laughs> name. But anyway, sitting around and having a black-on-black powwow about mm-hmm. what we going to do to help this community thrive or thrive better. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, a lot of those places are gone now. Mm-hmm. You know? Why is that? And such a, you know, it's not like African Americans don't have wealth. Well, that is a really good question to ponder. And I, I, I'm going to tell you, I have my say on that. As a matter of fact, I can, I can throw it in here right now. Okay, I think that we that. really, especially when it comes to folks like, who are sitting at the table right now, myself and Cindy, I'm not going to let you be quiet (laughs) anymore. Come on and chime in because we're concentrating on brother because we want to let folks know about his event taking place uh, on March 10th. Um, You know what? Um, On the the event specifics on the 10th, Mm -hmm. actually, I didn't even really have the date in my head. Um, I'm going to let Cindy 
say a little bit more okay. about that? Because I don't have it on, on the top of my okay. tongue right now. Go ahead. Sir. Okay. So uh, we're going to uh, be at the Washburn Library, Hennepin County Washburn Library, Saturday, March 10th. Um, and I believe it's three o'clock. Um, Ralph is going to present um, his workshop of a uh, workshopping of the lost Negroes of North America. Um, the documentary is not completed yet, but he's going to be presenting um, the silent film footage and um, sharing that with the community, getting some feedback um, and, um, you know, really just putting some thoughts out there, just like, we're, you know, we're asking is the Negro or was the Negro more progressive than the African American and really just um, creating that dialogue and really opening some eyes about some things that a lot of us have never thought about, you know, and for others, there's some older folks in the room who really say, yes, you know, you, you've got some really good points. And so, yeah, I can yeah. speak to that. And as a matter of fact, I want to know who you want to see in that audience, Cindy. Yes. But well, uh, yes. Had- yeah, I was going to just point out real quick and I'll give you a quick, quick fact. So right now, as we speak today, I think there's a movement happening or some energy being directed to having a um, black credit union or something like that. Yeah. Most definitely. Mm-hmm. Black said. So this is 2018, right? And that's uh, the yeah. African-American community, right? We're yeah. just kind of thinking about getting a credit union. What if I told you in that 10 year window, there was an associated Negro credit union in South Minneapolis on 37th and 4th Avenue. I can believe it. In South Minneapolis, yeah. there are so many mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. happening. Shh. Yeah. But yeah. it was on the low. Well, yeah, That's probably why I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, I, and I would probably say that it wasn't necessarily that on the low. I think that, you know, again, when you, when you're forced to, uh, through the, the different conditions that you live in, um, in this kind of, um, unofficial, um, on the low segregation that we that we've had for many years in this city uh nothing new going on there but um you know when 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 you have to work together as a people and depend on each other um to a certain degree um within communities that have been restricted for you to basically live in Mm -hmm. um that's not anything new either we still deal with those realities but um in that in that period, I'm telling you, in that ten year window, there was some um just unbelievable things that took place um that make two thousand eighteen look like we're the Oakland and, and they were the Wakanda. Uh, well let me tell you <laughs> what I would like to see, the folks that I would like to see walking up in that room would be the children That's right. who still have the residual finances mm-hmm. from that credit union in South Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. What I would like to see are some of the progeny of the pit masters who made the Market Barbecue and Rudolph's Barbecue <laughs> Plates famous. Mm-hmm. What I would like to see would be some of the people who really know what it was like to buy that first home in South Minneapolis Mm. and let those folks know who are in that community, you are not moving us out. (laughs) Well, you know, Brenda, it's interesting that you bring that up. Uh, Ralph mentioned the word restrictions. And one of the things that's also going to take place, this is actually our second presentation here in Minneapolis of this material, but um, we're going to be paralleling uh, the Lost Negroes of North America to the Mapping Prejudice Project that's mm. taking place in South Minneapolis. And so mm. there will be, uh, that team will be in place there as well. So it will, you know, that particular project will just become an expanded discussion based on this work that uh, Ralph is presenting as well. And, yeah. And keep in mind, this 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 uh, documentary is independently produced, mm-hmm. um, you know, through through us. Uh, so sometimes, you know, this is where the African American community needs to kind of look at itself. And have we reached a kind of a, a point where we only come out and appreciate ourselves when the good white liberal folks that finance some of our, um, projects, um, extend an invitation to our community mm-hmm. or, 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 or where are we at with that? Um, I think we're at a point where <laughs> there's only so many things that we can put on our calendar, and you better believe where one or two gather. So 
Cindy, you might not have thousands in the room, but you better believe that envoy that that one person with deep pockets sent to your event, For sure. that person should be treated like royalty, too. And you never can tell who's mm-hmm. in the room. Oh, no. And we don't discriminate. We don't, no, we, no, we every, don't. We no, don't we, discriminate. Listen, no. we want everybody no, no. there. I'm talking about the psychology right. that's going on yes. in this African-American community. But ain't that Minneapolis anyway? That's Minnesota. That's what you buy when you ca- cross over the border, coming mm-hmm. from south or west or wherever you're coming from. I think at one point in time, we did have um, definitely... Uh, an extreme um, amount of engagement that did not look like this. Mm -hmm. I've I've seen it myself. Well, you got to show that to me because I know I've been (laughs) here for over 20 years and I ain't seen that that much. What? Not lately. No, don't let me lie. I have seen it, but it's Mm -hmm. been in that really close enclave Mm -hmm. on a limited time basis. Yeah. And, and, and I got a couple of years on that 20 some years you've been here. So like, again, um, I, I think that what we're dealing with is we're dealing with kind of a generational breakdown of how we identify with self, how to survive this, uh, this psychological warfare that we deal with out here. Most definitely. And we need to quit telling us to be, don't tell my story. I can tell my own story. Got a mouth. Thank mm-hmm. you very much. Yes. And you will be a lot stronger when we fund our own stories too. Most definitely. And we talking about economic survival. Well, we have, this man in front of me, who is a celebrated filmmaker, this Absolutely. is not his first time at the rodeo. He knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. We've got Cindy Lewis. Cindy, what's your claim to fame again? Um, my claim to fame actually is um, Synth Karm Communications. Was It's it's a communications uh, organization that put together, um, you know, my background, as you know, Brenda, um, was communicating uh, culturally specific Arts and entertainment and news yeah, and information. I remember you right? from Penumbra. And so, yes. And so, um, you know, I went into radio, you know, another field of com- uh, I'm sorry, of communications and, um, actually got on the independent bandwagon just because, um, you know, I noticed that there was a, there was a lack obviously here and elsewhere. And so, uh, when I teamed up with this young man, um, I, I recognized his voice immediately. And so, uh, when he was talking about, um, you know, collaborating, t- collaborating our efforts to create something bigger, that's really kind of what my claim to fame is now. And really also reconnecting with uh, my own creative voice and my own artistry. And so, um, I'm, I'm just doing the independent thing too, trying to make a difference and trying to help share and spread, um, those things that I think we need to know more about. And when we do things like that, it's important that you have people, um, you know, like-minded people that are willing to struggle with the work, struggle with the art, struggle with the story, that um, have compassion um, for the struggle, because the struggle is what we're trying to overcome, mm-hmm. you know, in more ways than one. But we struggle definitely to get to a place. And the only way that you can actually get to those places many times is uh, being revolutionary and uh, the sense of your independence. And that's, that's the road of uh, a lot of people that are willing to travel. So when, when let's just put it like this in a, in kind of a present day African American, uh, description. Uh, so I found this valuable footage in a basement mm-hmm. or not even in a basement in a closet. And man, this is just extremely value. I mean, pictures from this era are, is mm-hmm. being applauded, um, here locally from this specific time period, even pictures. But this is actually film footage, which it makes it even more rare and more valuable. Now, most African-Americans would sit there and say, oh, my goodness, look at what I found. Let me write this grant and give it to the so-and-so mm-hmm. foundation and partner with them. And they're going to help me craft my story or my documentary or my play or my poem or whatever the case it is, you know. And we just keep begging keep writing, keep asking these people to fund our projects. Now, what's stopping us from doing that for ourselves? If you are not willing to struggle and walk that high road that Negroes did, um, then you lose power. You lose ownership. And so this is something that um, this kind of work is not for everybody. 
And everybody definitely has their own choice to how they navigate that space. But I can tell you this, um, we both have been on that road and there's definitely progress and freedom. Amen. Well, we'll walk that road in that fashion because independence is the way to go. Because before Black Panther, there was uh, Melvin Van Peebles. Mm-hmm. There was a whole lot mm-hmm. of other folks yeah. that did what you did mm-hmm. that brought that were brought in um, through the likes of people like mm, Isaac Hayes, I would think, had something to do with... Stacks? Yeah, well, mm-hmm. with Stacks, but also with Earth, Wind, and Fire being oh. a part of Melvin Van Peebles. Van Peebles' oh, soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Sweet yeah. Feedback. Mm-hmm. Hey, exactly. Those were some, some partnerships that started way back in the day, and mm-hmm. look how much of a, a, a institution those folks are in mm-hmm. our community. Uh, and I do mean our global community when it comes to the arts. That Cindy. Melvin Van Peebles example is excellent. There's a, actually a documentary um, about the about the making of Sweet mm-hmm. Sweetback song, mm-hmm. um, and it um, it's an excellent movie for those who uh, dare to be fearless enough to travel that path. And the pressure, the mm-hmm. pain, the the um, adversity, but on the other side of that is a smile and 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 something that can't be bought by that's, any kind of money. True. Yeah, what you gain, what we gain from that trepidation. Mm-hmm. And hmm. until then, you got to just go go to work and put in the work. You got to yeah. go to work and put in the work. And the, and the thing is, is we actually have to be part of creating, you know, um, what we want to see. I just wanted to put this in here. I'm going to smile when I say <laughs> this because it needs to be said. Y'all, I confirm but, it. He is smiling. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but in a place like uh, Minneapolis, the, the psychology, you know how a lot of these community groups, and um, you know, these people, they get this money and they do this mental health kind of um um, yeah, it always has the to mental health, the, yeah, the mental sense. health rap in the community, and the, the, a lot of the times the people that may or may not receive that money or might be suffering from mental health as they're telling other people to get mm. their mental health together. But what I'm trying to say is psychologically, in a in a city like Minneapolis, in this northern experience, um, when we um, actually claim that position of not being attached to the um to the close um loyalty of our funders oh boy <laughs> man oh man they come whoa they don't they do not like that here boy freedom freedom here is an interesting thing cuz you know freedom here is uh, you know funded by you know a lot of white liberal money um hmm. which um which I don't know is, uh, you know, uh, people's gracious gifts are, are, are you know, it's cool. I, I get it. But, you know, there's politics behind money and well, there's um, power like behind the, money. Thank too. you. It's like this grant that I uh, wrote for for it was a international grant. Yeah. Um, and I was told that um, we don't do stuff here in the United States, we do most of our stuff over here in Africa. As a matter of fact, we focus mm-hmm. on Africa. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, yeah, you got to do the focus on Africa because you got to do a lot to clean up all the mess you made over there. Right. When you're, so I guess I won't be going back to that mm-hmm. institution again. Mm-hmm. But that's the, that's, the, um, that's the road you have to trod when you're uh, receiving money from another entity sure. outside of yourself. And that's, let me get back to the film. And that's what w- some of the observations of, as we reflect on this history and why the word Negro became so negative at a certain point in time, because uh, um, at a certain point in time, you know, a lot of Negroes were called race men. And if people, you know, that's mm-hmm. some, you know, grandparents used to say, oh, he was a race man, mm-hmm. you know, and that came out of the. Does that mean the, militant? Um, well, I mean, that definitely means you're for the, for the people, for, uh-huh. for and about the people, you okay. know what I'm saying? Uh, but, um, because of this growing, expanding, um, economic prosperity due to, uh, these segregated communities that, um, thrive from each other. And built with each other. Um, you know, they had to destroy that. And, you know, you had to look at how do we integrate these Negroes dollars into ours? Well, then we need to actually, you know, um, get some Negro spokespeople, some Negro leaders 
um, prop up some Negro organizations and uh, potentially um, send in some Negro infiltrators. Yeah, and and break down these and break down these Negro communities while we get their Negro money. So if <laughs> if, if I'm following your line of thinking, then that means taking out Wall Street, Black Wall Street, was basically about taking away the competition. Yeah. Well, they bombed Black Wall right. Street. That's a whole oh, different well, thing. That was yeah, annihilation, yeah, but still, we <laughs> took away the competition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I yeah. mean, let's, let's be real about yeah. it. I think a lot of people see all of these events that took place almost like they're seeing a movie on TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah that happened back then. It yeah. won't never happen again. Oh, don't sleep. And this, this is why history is very important. Uh, documentation is extremely important. And um, being fearless enough to um, speak your word without compromise or fear and without bowing to um, the power and influence of politics or money. Um, it, it, you know, we need, we need those kind of people to um, press us to think a little more critically at times. And usually the arts help do that. So a medium like, um, you know, film or uh, theater, or, you know, uh, music, you know, those kind of things. You know, artists have good gifts to be able to push the um, push how the people kind of deal with their present day realities through um, a structured way and how we deal with that and the presentation of an artistic art form like film. You're listening to Fresh Air Community Radio, KFAI 90.3 FM, Minneapolis, and operating translator K294 AM, West St. Paul.